All right. Well, we're talking uh, about uh, vision and our priorities for the future. And after 29 years as a church, uh, where do we go from here? It's not about facilities or programs that are just uh, tools to help us build, maybe vehicles to get us down the road. But the foundation for it all is what Pastor Jeff began to talk about last week. Prayer is the basis of the foundation for everything that we do. It's the inspiration. It's the power behind it all. Without prayer, nothing of eternal significance is going to happen in this place. But along with prayer needs to go hand in hand a devotion to God's word. Nothing uh, that is truly from God will ever contradict what he's already established uh, for us in his word. It's the blueprint. It's the pattern for our lives as individuals and for anything we intend to accomplish uh, as a church. In fact, God's word is embodying the person of Christ uh, is the basis of all creation. John begins his gospel by declaring, in the beginning was the word. In doing so, he emphasizes the fact that everything God does begins and ends with his word. Luke says in chapter 21, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But that presents a challenge for us today because people's regard for the word has changed pretty drastically over the last few decades uh, in a way that many church leaders think is a, a huge hindrance to our ability to impact society for Christ. Um, I look at what's going on and I say, man, how can we do that when uh, the civil discourse is being stripped of, of any biblical reference and, and uh, Americans are increasingly living in a scripture-free public space? But the larger scandal is what's happening within the church. Because you can choose whatever statistic or survey you like, but the general pattern is the same. And that is the knowledge of the Bible is diminishing fast. And it shows. Because over the last several decades, we've had a great emphasis on uh, church attendance. And we've come up with all kinds of creative ways to get people involved. And, and we've tried to remove any hindrance uh, for people uh, coming and attending our churches. We've crafted our presentations of worship uh, and the message to meet felt needs. And in many cases, uh, this has had a great effect. And, and there are people now who are coming into our churches and filling our seats that never would have otherwise. And at the same time, a lot of our scholars and publishers and resource centers have translated the Bible into uh, all kinds of languages and versions to meet the needs of uh, today's audience. We've broken free from the limitations of the printed page, and we now have the Bible on our computers and tablets and smartphones. And no matter where we go, the Word is always as close as a device in your pocket. But despite all the ease of access to the Word, fewer people are actually reading it and studying it and definitely living it. Because church attendance and access to the Bible alone can't make us what God wants us to be. To live like Christ, we need a much deeper commitment to learning and living what we see in his word. But in many cases, that's not happening because churches have designed their service and programs to place more emphasis on getting people through the doors and keeping their attention than they do on discipling and teaching. And as worship attendance has increased, a lot of times the learning forums have disappeared. And that can produce a wider church, but a lot shallower Christian. So tonight I'm going to deal with the topic of biblical illiteracy. And many Christians today, particularly evangelicals and Pentecostals, including our leaders in the Assemblies of God, they feel that the lack of knowledge and insight regarding God's Word may, may just be the greatest uh, crisis facing the 21st century church. Now... Uh, I don't know about that, but I can tell you this. I'm not quite sure that I can do justice to a topic of that magnitude in the next 30 minutes. And, uh, and I know that. So tonight, I'm not going to take a lot of time to lay out all kinds of statistics to illustrate the problem. I'm not going to try to uh, go into a defense of the authority and the authenticity of Scripture. Because I'm confident that a, a Sunday night crowd already recognizes the seriousness of this issue and is committed to the truth of God's word. So I want to offer basically a, a, a more practical challenge, not just for knowing more about God's word, but doing more about it. Now, men, if you weren't here to uh, hear my message on the morning of Father's Day, uh, honestly, you need to go back and listen to it. Uh, for, for one thing, the first 20 minutes or so will give you a whole different impression of my uh, uh, sense of humor and seriousness. Uh, but it'll also give you uh, a, a vast array of character traits that we need to develop in our lives in order to impact our culture for Christ. And I don't say that as a shameless plug for my message, 
But I say that to illustrate the fact that what I would have to say to men or anybody in the church is quite different than the message the culture is trying to send us. So let me illustrate it this way. GQ magazine is an iconic publication for men. They recently put out a list of 21 books that you don't need to read before you die. Now, it wasn't surprising to see that the Bible was uh, on that list, smack dab right in the middle of it at number 12. And here's what the editors said about the Bible. They called it repetitive, self-contradictory, foolish, and ill-intentioned. Now, if they think the God who so loved the world that he gave is ill-intentioned, then they obviously don't know him. But the Bible tells us that uh, its teaching is going to seem like foolishness to those who are perishing. So far as contradictions, the Bible doesn't contradict itself as much as it contradicts people's own worldview and perception of him. And it is true that the Bible is repetitive on many issues as God tries to penetrate our hard hearts and get things through to us because that's what it takes. But no matter how many times the Bible says something, no matter how many times it goes into it, people just aren't listening. And I'm not just talking about the culture at large. Because the real crisis is what is or is not happening in the church. And the world sees it. Here's how GQ started that segment talking about the Bible. They said the Holy Bible is rated very highly by all the people who supposedly live by it, but who in actuality have never read it. That perception is probably pretty accurate. Findings from the Barna Group, a, a Christian pollster, he says over half of all churchgoers are unable to identify basic biblical priorities, including the Great Commission. Few can name the four Gospels or identify even two or three of the disciples or half the Ten Commandments. Many question whether the devil or heaven or hell are real. There was another survey where a significant percentage of adults thought that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. They thought the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. And the knowledge gap just widens from generation to generation. Because you tell me how we're going to begin to develop a biblical worldview on issues like human sexuality when over half of the uh, high school seniors in one survey said that Sodom and Gomorrah were a married couple. So, I think GQ is probably fairly astute in getting to the heart of what I want to address tonight. And I'm going to narrow my focus to what probably is one of the most practical things that we can do to maybe begin to stem the tide of biblical illiteracy in our own lives and in our own little corner of the world. Because after all, it starts with us. Last year I was up here, I preached a message on the fact that, that the healing in our land has got to start with, with those who know uh, and follow Christ. It needs to be their intense pursuit of him that kicks things off so that the world will begin to take notice. And a lot of times as Pentecostals, I know we believe in the power of the Spirit to be our uh, strength and our teacher, but if we ignore the textbook, then it hinders the Spirit's ability to accomplish His purposes with us. So I want us to look at what the book says about some people who faced a similar crisis involving the disconnect uh, from God's Word. Hosea chapter 4, and if you want to turn there, you can. I've got a lot of scripture I'll be going through, and it should be up on the screen if they got it uh, ready in time. But Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 God says this, he says, hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, talking to, to supposedly his own people, because the Lord had a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land, only cursing and lying and murder, stealing and adultery. Listen to this, they break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up, and he's not just talking physically, and all the land li live waste away. My people, in verse number 6 of Hosea 4, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of God, I will also ignore your children. This is talking about a time of moral and spiritual turmoil when people, it says, were breaking all boundaries. And the reason it was happening is because those who were supposed to know God didn't. They had access to the word. A lot of them probably knew what it said, but they disregarded it. They ignored it. In fact, I was thinking about this. You know the root word, the root of the word ignorance is simply to ignore? You ignore something over and over, you're going to be ignorant to it. And that's what led to their destruction in every facet of society. And that's one of the effects of ignoring God's word. One of the effects of biblical illiteracy is destruction. But long before that happens, something more sinister creeps in, and it's one of the most prevalent symptoms of biblical illiteracy that will be obvious in the last days before Jesus returns. And it's very elusive because when it's happening, people don't realize it's happening. 
And that's the issue of spiritual deception because often when the Bible talks about the moral and spiritual climate in the last days, it warns how easily people are going to be deceived. Matthew and Luke talk about it. Paul warns Timothy and the Thessalonians and the Galatians about the lies and the false teaching and all these ideas that are going to seem reasonable and appealing but are so subtly deceptive that if God didn't shorten the time, uh, even people who truly believe would be prone to fall for those lies. So what's the remedy for that? We stay in tune with God's word so that we recognize falsehood. We stay in tune with the Spirit so that when even we're not sure of what's going on, He can at least speak to us and say, something isn't right here, something's off. But I can guarantee that those who are illiterate regarding God's Word and cannot recognize His voice, they will be deceived. It's just a matter of time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 says that in the last days, God will <clears throat> excuse me, send a powerful delusion to overtake people who, quote, refuse to love the truth. They won't even be able to comprehend it. Because in other words, God's going to let people get carried away by the lies that they chose to believe. Let's look at another passage in Amos chapter 8. Similar situation with God's people because things happen over and over. That's why God repeats a lot of things in his word. In Amos chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1, he says to Amos, he said, uh, this is what the sovereign Lord showed me, a basket of fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked, a, a basket of ripe fruit. He's talking about being ripe for judgment. The time is right for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. He's talking about his own people who are going through the routines of worship and, and, and the feigning that they know and, and love God. Many bodies flung everywhere. Hear this, you trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. Verse number 5 of Amos 8. They, they're saying this, and I'll, it's just a second. I'll, he says, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? When will the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? In other words, they were asking, when can we get past all these times that are set aside for God so we can get on to our own business? If that's what they wanted, God said in verse 10, I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all you wear sackcloth and shave your heads and make that time like mourning. And then in verse number 11, he says this. And this is what I want you to see in this passage. He says, the days are coming because of all this disregard for God's word among people who went through all the trappings. He said, this is my word. When I will, uh, the day is coming when I will send a famine throughout the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Again, these are people that are on a fast track toward destruction because they felt somehow that their issues were more important than God's. They wanted to get on with their own corrupt affairs and they didn't have the time or tolerance for God's word. Does that sound familiar to us today? You see, God established his word as, as kind of a, a, a cultural watershed, something to protect people from themselves. And you remove that hedge of protection from the heart and mind of a person or a civilization and the walls of protection begin to crumble and their societies begin to collapse. Ultimately, nothing is going to stand that doesn't remain founded on God's word. So the first point I simply want you to see out of that is the issue of feast or famine. We have a choice that we can either be feasting on God's word because if it's laid out in front of us and we choose to ignore it, we're headed for a famine because biblical illiteracy grows when people ignore God rather than acknowledge him. Now, I don't expect the secular culture to accept or understand the word, but the fact is that's still no excuse for them or us because there's never been a time when people have had more opportunity to hear the word and to learn from it. And yes, yet we see less effect from God's word in our culture than many places around the world where the gospel is scarce. We're living in a time where we could be gorging on the word, literally uh, feasting to our heart's content, and instead, we too may be headed for that spiritual famine. Because that's what happens when those with the opportunity to relish in the word choose instead to reject it. Now, I hope that we're nowhere near the conditions that were described in that passage. But like the prophets of old, we in the, need the church need to take responsibility for our culture. We need to be the ones to go to God on behalf of a nation that is rapidly approaching a point of no return. I want you to look at Romans chapter 1 with me. We've seen some Old Testament examples. I want to look at one a little closer to home. Not just because it's New Testament, but you're going to hear the things in this. It's going to sound very familiar. In Romans chapter 1, verse number 18, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven 
against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since they may be no, uh, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen and being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. That's what I just said. For although they knew God, okay, again, talking about people who look like they know God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of uh, the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. But listen to this in verse number 24, just like what we saw in the Old Testament. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity and degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship uh, and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God then gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for each other. Verse number 28, this is the key here. It says, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Apparently they had it. Apparently they were exposed to it. Apparently it was put before them. But they didn't think it was worthwhile to retain it. For that reason, it says, God gave them over to a depraved mind, so they uh, do what ought not to be done. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, envy, murder, strife, malice, gossip, slanders, hate, all the things we see going on in our society. They invent ways of doing evil. It goes on to say so. And then at the end of that, in verse number 32, it says, they not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those who do. There's a lot of people in the culture who may not take a stand, say one way, they, oh, I'm really into this, but they'll sure defend the people to do whatever things they want to do. If that doesn't describe our culture, I don't know what does. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. These passages paint a pretty depressing picture uh, of things, but there was a common thread in every case, Old Testament, New Testament, us today, and that is that people brought judgment on themselves by rejecting disregarding, and in many cases just simply ignoring God's word because it imposed on their way of life. And ultimately, God let them go their own way. Now, I'm not saying the church fits this pattern, but our responsibility is much higher. With all the access we have to biblical resources and ministry, the main problem is not how much we know or do not know about the Bible. The problem is what we do with the knowledge we already have. Some people know a lot about the Bible, others know very little, but the odd thing is in either case, the lives tend to look about the same. So it's no wonder that a lot of people conclude, what's the use of gaining more Bible knowledge? Because it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't affect anybody's life. And I think that's at least part of the reason for biblical illiteracy in our culture. It's not just a matter of people not knowing the word. Because uh, I thought about it, there's been times throughout history when people have had less access to the word. Times when they were literally illiterate in every sense. There was times when only the, the leaders and the priests were allowed to handle and dispense the word. And I know in those times that the people at large probably knew less of God's word than most people do today. And yet the parts that they did know, they had a higher regard for those things. So I think the problem today isn't just that the world is disregarding the vast opportunities it has to learn God's word. But I think maybe it's the church disregarding the responsibility to truly live the word. And whether it's a lack of learning or a lack of living, the end result can end up the same. And that's a spiritual drought. A spiritual famine. There's a lot of times, and you and I have probably both been there, when, when we just feel dry spiritually. And there are ebbs and flows in every aspect of our life. But many times when we feel that dryness, we need to look at what we're doing with the things that God has already shown us. Because a spiritual famine is what's in store for a culture or a church that's content to be biblically illiterate. But becoming literate in the Word requires more than just being exposed to church the services, the classes, the small groups. It means looking into the word for yourself. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. It says, happy or blessed is the one who reads this book. And those who listen to the words of this prayer. And when it's talking about listening in scripture, it's talking about beginning to take it in and do something with it. And obey what is written. Because that's talking about more than just reading or reciting or reacting to the word. That's about retaining the word so ultimately we can respond to it. It's got to take hold of our hearts and minds and become part of who we are. Because those in Romans 1 didn't think it was worthwhile to retain that knowledge. 
But retaining just doesn't happen automatically because we hear it a lot or, or even because we believe it. James uh, talks about uh, the fact that true faith, biblical belief, requires action, requires stepping out and doing something with it. Jesus told us as much himself. In John 13, 17, he says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. In John 14, he says this, if you love me, keep my commands. Yeah, it's about a relationship. It's not all the doing. But if we love God, that test is what we're going to do. God is looking for people who love and trust him enough to pursue his ways rather than their own ways. And biblical obedience is not just about obligation or duty. It's, it's a, a freeing and liberating opportunity for us to, to be in tune with the God of all creation so he can fulfill his perfect purposes in us. You know, we sing a lot of worship songs that express our, our uh, need and our desire for more of God. But I'll be honest, sometimes, and maybe this is a cynical thought, but sometimes I think, why should God teach us more unless we've learned to obey what he, he's already shown us, what we already know? In fact, the more Bible knowledge we gain without putting it into practice, it's just going to desensitize us to any more truth. And we can decry the biblical literacy in our culture but we can't expect people outside the church to have any reasonable understanding or especially a desire for the Bible. Because if they don't see God's word alive in us, then i got to wonder, why would they even consider it? Because I don't think we stand any chance of convincing people of the truth unless they see God's uh, life-transforming power in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 basically refers to that. Paul talks to the people in the Corinthian church and he says that your life is a letter that is known and read by everyone. That means that you and I are the only Bible that some people are reading. Their whole impression of God and church and Christianity is what they see in us. And so I have to ask, is their impression like the one that GQ has, that we really don't know the word that we claim to believe? Or is Christ's character showing through us? Is his peace evident in our storms? Is his power evident in our needs? Is his love reaching through us to heal hearts because I contend that knowing the word is not the only issue we face today. Perhaps it's not even the main issue. I think a large part of our problem today and throughout history is not getting people to know more about the Bible but getting people to live the parts that they already know. And no amount of preaching or teaching or weekly Bible studies is going to fix it. And I'm all for teaching. Okay, I'm a teacher. I'm doing some of that right now. But the remedy for biblical illiteracy is not just more teaching, it's more doing. And that's not for the sake that we're trying to gain God's favor or work in our salvation. Because the same passage in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that says we're saved by grace through faith and that it's not of works goes on to say right after that in verse number 10 that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he intends for us to do good works if we truly are saved. But actions start with thoughts because Whatever you continually think on, you're eventually going to act on, whether that's good or bad. So when it comes to God's word, it's not a matter of what we know, but what we do with what we know. The learning and the living have to go hand in hand. And that's the point I really want you to get out of this tonight, is learning and living. Biblical literacy is about putting God's principles into practice. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. Not the sand, but the light that's going to stand when the storms of life pound on it builds his house on the rock of doing and putting it into practice. James 1, verse 22 and through 25 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. If we walk in and out of here and we think, Oh, that was a great message. We accept it. We hear it. We believe it. But don't do anything with it. We're deceiving ourselves. It says, Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now that's a weird picture. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. You see, when we look at the Bible, it's like looking into a mirror. It shows us who we are. It shows us what we can be, what we become. It shows us what needs fixing. It shows us things that may be out of place. And when we look at that, if we walk away and we don't do anything with the knowledge that we have, it's as good as forgotten. Now, I don't know about you. I may forget a face from time to time, but one of them's not my own. So when I look at that and say, it's like somebody walks away from a mirror and forgets their own face, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. 
Well, folks, that's how ridiculous it is to be exposed to God's word, to see the truth there, to see exactly what needs to change, and yet we walk away from it and do nothing with it. Because the hearing and the doing is the only way that we're going to retain it. If we don't put the word into practice, it's not going to stick. It's not going to become part of us. When it comes to Bible knowledge, in fact, you say this, you really only learn what you lived. There's been a lot of people over time who've known a lot of scripture. Religious leaders of Jesus, they did. The scholars of today, but they didn't have a relationship with God. When a person has an authentic relationship with Jesus, that, that relationship should be apparent. When we learn from the Bible, it should change the way we think about everything. Our relationships, our finances, our work, our entertainment choices, all of it should change. We should begin to see the world different. So while it's important to keep adding to our knowledge and understanding of God's word, it's absolutely vital to do something with what we already know. That's how we really gain understanding. That's when God is going to begin to show us even more. That's when the world around us is going to begin to see the truth of God's word in action. So whenever we hear or study or, or any time we encounter the word, the aim should be action. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that the word is alive and active. The more you get into the word, the more the word gets into you, and it will change your life from the inside out. So, I could go into all kinds of practical ways that we could begin to learn, link learning to living, and there's other contexts where I'll do that. But I want to wrap things up by considering just one very practical thing we could do in the course of our personal study, or any time we hear from the word. And it has to do with a concept that uh, the world and other religions has, has really tainted. And the Psalms talks a lot about it. Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3 says this. Those who are always meditating on his laws are like trees along a riverbank bearing fruit. They will never wither. Whatever they do prospers. Psalm 119, 15. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on on your statutes. And Joshua 1.8, we know this passage of scripture, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The goal of meditating on God's word is to put it into practice so we succeed at fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. Now, our culture's fascination with Eastern religions and things like that have really skewed and clouded this concept uh, of meditating because meditating on God's word uh, is a very practical concept. It's not some mystical, uh, metaphysical, mellowing out process that we need to get in touch with our, with our inner self. Meditating on God's word is a way that we allow it to get into our mind and spirit so it can get out and begin to affect everything we do. And it really is, this, this is really the picture of what it means to meditate. We're in farm country, a lot of you, are, you, know, you know cattle. Uh, cows, when they chomp up their grass and they start chewing that, they, they chew their cud. They've got like four stomachs. And they swallow the stuff, and then they hock it back up after a while and chew on it some more. And then they take it down if it goes into another stomach and they hock it and they chew on it some more. And that's the picture you get of what it means to meditate. It means to take and, and you get a passage of scripture, you look at it, you read it, you see it, and then you just begin to ponder it over and over. You mull it over in your mind and say, what, what is this really saying to me? What does it mean in, this, in the context of it? What is it saying to me today? Uh, what does it want me to do with this knowledge? And the aim is that we find a way to apply it to our lives. And that's the practicality of meditating on the word to see really what difference it should make in our lives. And meditating on the word is really just a first step in the process of turning learning into living and putting faith into action. Because again, actions start as thoughts. And if you want to apply the scripture deeply, you got to think on it deeply. In fact, the, most, uh, uh, the deepest component of literacy, we're talking about being literate, is being able to process your thoughts in another language. If you learn a new language, the indication that you're at the point where you're fully fluent is when you have the ability to think and plan in that language. Not just when you're speaking and asking things, but you can begin to think in those concepts. And that's how scripture transforms our mind. It talks about in Romans 12 too. When the Bible changes our thinking so that we begin to plan and to respond to what God's word reveals. That's when we're going to have a transformed life. So the goal of hearing and reading and studying and meditating constantly on the word is that we take action with it. And when we regard it so deeply that it not only brings a greater understanding of God's ways and character, but it begins to change us in a way that other people can begin to see it 
and we begin to gain an insight into Scripture. And that means getting both a big picture of things and uh, a picture of the more details of Scripture so we can see how everything fits together. I kind of illustrate it like this. And this isn't a perfect illustration, but, but it's kind of like when you're putting together a puzzle. Now, the Bible's not meant to be puzzling, but when you uh, go to put together a puzzle, you set the box out there, and you see the picture that, that it's ultimately supposed to get to, and you get in your mind what that is. And then you start to lay it out, and you lay out those parameters. You find the flat pieces and the square pieces, and, and you look and you see those boundaries, and you begin to lay those things out. And you get, uh, but you always keep that big picture in mind. Because when you start to pick up those little pieces of the puzzle and you begin to see the, the, the texture and you see, well, this has a little red piece on this nub here and here's another one that, and you begin to see where things uh, fit together, that only happens when you can begin to tell how it all fits in the big picture. Because sometimes you get a little portion put together and it looks like that's all there is and, and you can say, oh, wow, here's what it is. But then you step back and oh, the bigger picture is this. And you need that broad picture of God's word that, 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 that thing of not just seeing the Bible with 600 different stories or even 66 books, but as one unified plan. And that means developing an overarching understanding of the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. So you understand how his plan unfolds and you have a basis to build on. And then when you begin to look at those finer points and you see the shapes and you see where they fit with other things, always keeping that big picture in mind because apart from that, the details don't make a lot of sense. There's a lot of people that know the details of scripture but they don't see the overall picture and they don't understand what God is really up to. And when we take time to ponder the word more deeply, it helps us not only glean facts, not only the, the what, whens, and where's, and why, uh, where, what, whens, and where's, because that's all context and that's vital so we don't pull things out in a wrong way. But we begin to understand the deeper principles. We begin to apply it in ways that even though maybe this specific situation today isn't found in the Bible, we know a principle that applies because we begin to understand the whys and the hows and God's character and what he's doing as part of a bigger plan. Now, we're going to give you some tools down the road to help you with daily Bible study and some plans that will help you on a day-to-day -day basis and be able to bring families together, kind of putting them on the same page. But tonight... Uh, I just want to give you a couple practical examples as we close about what it looks like maybe to kind of think on these finer points and, and meditate on, on, on the scripture. For example, if you're looking, say, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 14, and you look at the passage here, and it's talking about the weak and the strong, and it goes into the fact that one person's faith allows them to eat something, and another person doesn't, and one that regards this day, and another that day is more important. All these different matters of conscience that can be different from person to person. And we begin to look at that and realize, well, yeah, I see that in my life and other people's life. And then it begins to give us some principles to apply to that. And one of them, it says, don't judge your brother or sister. So if somebody can do something, maybe I can't. i got to be careful that I'm not condemning them for it. But then they also have to look at me and says, if somebody who can't do these things, that uh, uh, we shouldn't have passed judgment. We need to be fully convinced in our own mind. But we need to do whatever uh, makes every effort to make peace with people. And we don't want to do anything to put a stumbling block in, in somebody's way. So I begin to look at those principles and I begin to chew on them and say, what are some of these matters of conscience, you know, uh, in my life or in our culture? And, and immediately several of those things come to mind. It might be the type of entertainment uh, choices you might make. Uh, it might be, you know, some people have one view of it, drinking or not drinking or going to movies or not or other things like that. Those are all some of the issues that are matters of conscience. And so I begin to say, well, what is this really saying to those? It says, and then you get to verse number 22, because that's one of the verses in this passage that nobody really ever hits on when they see it. We talk about not ju judging. We talk about not putting a, a stumbling block. But verse number 22 says, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Well, man, what, what does that mean? That mean I'm not supposed to share? Well, not to share with people. no. But that means that if I'm the person who maybe can do, can't do something and I'm looking at something, I don't step out and I don't make judgment and pass judgment on somebody. But it also applies to the person who maybe can do something. That, that they don't uh, think they have to just put it out there to everybody and say, hey, look how free I am. And then you begin to put that piece with what you know uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that talks about the food. And some people eat this food and some don't. And it talks about don't abuse your freedom. And if you have the liberty to do something, sometimes if you think that you know more than you do, you're going to take the posture, well, you know what, I'm free to do this. So I'm just going to do it because they need to see how free I am and how free they should be able to 
be. And it says when you act like that, you're actually make, putting yourself in the position of the one who is sinning the greater sin because you're using and flaunting your freedom in a way that puts it with other people. So I begin to put that together and I say, well, how does that affect today? It's telling me not to, not to put it out there for everybody. Well, what's, what's a way that we put everything out there that we're doing? Younger, what, how do they put everything? Well, social media. They're putting it all out there. No filter at all. So I begin to say, should this affect that aspect of my life? That's a big aspect of my life. So I look at that and think, well, you know what? It says keep things to, to between me and God. So I begin to say, you know what? Maybe in that arena of my life, I better be careful not to slap something out there that's going to pass judgment on somebody. Pastor has talked about that. Don't put a lot of stuff out there politically and getting on somebody's case. Say, you shouldn't be doing it. That's not the forum for it. But at the same time, I look and say, if I'm free to do it, maybe that's not the forum to put it out there for me and 600 of my closest friends. Because you know what? Maybe I can sit down and have a drink, but somebody else, I know that's not good for them. So maybe just a few that you're with can handle that, but you don't have to put it out there for everybody to show what you're doing. If you're on the beach and you're uh, scandally clad and the people that are with you, the same maybe one thing, but you might want to not post that for everybody else to gawk at the whole time because that may be a stumbling block to somebody. So all of a sudden, these concepts begin to start to connect and you begin to think on a deeper level and all of a sudden, a very practical aspect of Scripture hits a very practical aspect of your life and it begins to make a difference in what you do. And all of a sudden, we live with that higher regard for other people. We put others before ourselves and we realize that we're living to their conscience and not just our own. Maybe an example of that on the bigger scale, a big scale picture, is the issue of uh, when God in the Old Testament told him just to kill everybody. That's a tough issue. That's one of those issues that you look at Scripture and say, man, how do I defend that? And there's a lot of people in the world who say that's one of the issues. How could God, God is a genocidal God. He's a, and you look at them and say, how, man, what do I make of that? And so we begin to put that together in our understanding of God and say, well, well, what was going on with these people that God said just to, to, to destroy? What was happening with them? And we begin to look a little closer and see that God describes them, that they'd reached a point of no return. They'd reached a point where God had given them every chance and it wasn't going to turn back. So if he would have spared them, what would have happened? They would have brought greater judgment on themselves. They were already going to be judged. They're bringing greater judgment. Future generations they would bring would just be bringing people into the world that would be condemned because God, we don't know this, but God knew that they had reached that point. So all of a sudden you begin to see that that doesn't clash with a merciful God. The most merciful thing he could have done was just put it to an end. So it didn't perpetuate it. And then you begin to see God's plan. And you say, if this would have allowed to go on, even one little glimmer of it could have got into God's people and, and directed the, redirected the course of his plan and took them off course. And so you begin to see that it fits with this whole plan. And, and that doesn't answer all these questions just in real quick time. But you see how you begin to come to terms with some issues where you see how things fit in the larger picture. Because you begin to understand God's whole plan. You begin to see elements of his character and how they fit with other passages that may be difficult to comprehend. But all that starts with thinking and pondering and meditating and taking one aspect of Scripture and putting together what you know from other pieces and beginning to get a whole picture. And pretty soon you start to get that puzzle all put together and it just begins to make a beautiful tapestry that shows us what God wants to do in our lives. And that's just a simple thing. That's just kind of a start to what it means to look at things from a deeper perspective. So we begin to see who God is and how he operates. We begin to understand, as the Bible calls, his ways a little bit better. And we can apply it a little more thoroughly so we can impact the world around us. Now, we're not going to solve the issue of biblical illiteracy overnight. In fact, we're not going to solve it over, over decades because the world uh, is never going to get it. And they don't even want to get it. But we can begin to make a difference in the lives of those people who are truly searching and open for the truth if those of us who know and follow God are willing to put it into practice. We're living in a society that's biblically illiterate. We're in a church that is teetering on that sometime. Not just this church, I hope, but the church at large is in the midst of that. They're ignoring a lot of what's in God's word because that's not popular. That's not going to fill the pews. And they're going to be in store for a spiritual famine if we're not careful. I don't want to be in on that. I want to be right in the middle of what God wants to do. I want you to stand with me tonight. And this is kind of one of those messages where, um, you know, it's just kind of a now go and do it sort of thing. There's not a lot of time that, that we need to, to, to maybe linger. But I do want to open the altars tonight. And here, here's the challenge. I want you to take 
Just maybe one, maybe two things that you know God has told you recently. Maybe it's something God has showed you in a, in a message, a preach from this pulpit, or maybe in your own devotional time. And, and it's been something that, that hits you pretty hard and that you really, maybe you really liked it or maybe it was kind of tough to take, but it's something you really haven't taken action with. I don't want us to become hardened to that truth over and over. I don't want us to disregard or just simply ignore it or pass by it. I want to become literate. I want to retain that. I want it to become part of me. But the only way that happens is if we look in that mirror, we see what God shows us, and we do something with it. We fix what needs to be fixed. We start walking in the way he tells us to walk. We claim the promise he tells us to do. So tonight, I want you to just spend a few moments, and sometimes it helps to, to, to just come down here and, and meet God at this altar. It represents a place of encounter with God. And maybe it's just where you're at to have a seat for a few seconds and just to linger and to chew on that for just a while. Maybe you pull out your Bible. You might know exactly where it was that God. Look at that. Begin to chew on it. Begin to ponder it over and over. Begin to ask, what, what's going on there, God? Why are, you, why are you doing it? What are you trying to show me? How can I apply this to my life? Begin to think on it to the point where it begins to sink in and take root and eventually makes its way out in your life. And I want you to ask God, God, help me to take this truth or two that you showed me recently and walk out of this place at uh, night, not just with the intention to apply it, but I've got a plan. I'm going to do something about it. And that's what I want you to do tonight. God, let me just pray for you. God, I thank you for the opportunity to get into your word. I thank you that word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It gets down into, uh, into our deep in our lives. It discerns our thoughts and intents and motives. And it makes a difference in the way that we live. And Lord, tonight I pray that the table you lay before us all the time, we are so rich. We, we've got so much before us. Sometimes I just feel like a, a spiritual glutton with all, the, the, all that we have. But God, you invite us to come and eat and, and to indulge in that. But God, I pray that we would not push away from the table. God, that we would not ignore that feast of your word that's laying before us in this culture. God, because those who do neglect it are in for a famine. I don't want that to happen with anybody in this place. So tonight I pray that, that as we look around our culture, and maybe it's a lot easier to get frustrated with what we see than it is to be compassionate, but we see the lack of knowledge. We see the disregard for God. We see people going their own ways. We see people who don't think it's worth their while to retain it. We see all the things that were described in Scripture, and we see a culture like that, but God, we in the church, we can't be like that. We don't want to be like that. And so God, I pray that we will do more than just learn it. God, we ask you for more, but God, help us to do something with what you've already shown us. You've shown us so much. And God, I pray one by one, the principles that you teach us, we'll begin to apply them every day of our lives. As we walk out of this place every week, we don't just congratulate the pastor for preaching a good word. Lord, we go out with the intention of putting it into action. God, because people out there are not ever going to perk up. They're not ever going to look to the word. They're not ever going to take notice of spiritual things unless they see it in us. God, I pray as we begin to live the word, you'll begin to let that evidence show. You'll begin to let the power of your spirit be evident in our lives. Uh, you'll, you'll let the joy and the fruit of your spirit be evident to the people around us. And I pray when that happens that they'll begin to ask us. They'll begin to want to find out. And Lord, the thirst that, that so many people have today, I pray that they'll, they'll look to us to find that source of satisfaction. So tonight, speak to our hearts in these closing moments. Show us something that you've already revealed to us, something we've already learned, something we've heard, something we've read. But maybe we have yet to turn that learning into living and help us to do that as we go from this place tonight. And we thank you for how you're going to use us and everything you can do through us for it's all for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Would you find that place to spend a few moments and just, just meditate on the word of God and let him show you how he wants you to put his truth into action.